Advancing the cause of liberty takes more than just coming up with ideas. It means making them happen. This is Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to another episode of Society in the State. Brian Hyde here along with Connor Boyack. And if you are a person who eats food on a daily basis, I think you're going to really appreciate uh, not only our guest today, but uh, what he has to say and what he has been through. We want to welcome John Duarte. He is with Duarte Nurseries in California. And John, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to hear you present at what was known as the Range Rights and Resource Symposium, along with a lot of other great people. And you had a very compelling story about your um, fight that has lasted for several years with various federal bureaucracies, and it started from you planting wheat on your own land. Now, feel free to fill in any of the background information, but how does uh, the act of planting wheat turn into a multi-million dollar fine and extended court battle? Well, it starts with confused bureaucrats, uh, under-resourced because what they're patrolling is not within their jurisdiction as afforded by Congress to begin with. The Army Corps of Engineers office in in the northern Sacramento Valley, which is the part of the California's great central valley above Sacramento, our capital. So if you go above San Francisco and Lake Tahoe, way up into the north, there is just an amazing food mecca up up there, just like there is down here where I live in Modesto and south of me through Fresno and Bakersfield. This is the central valley here in California and other important areas of California produce a tremendous amount of America's food. Not necessarily a lot of its grain products, but if you look at the chart of of what's produced here in California, uh, we're producing 99% of the country's almonds, the asparagus, the salad, fruits and vegetables and nuts. Um, We're the biggest net export in the country of of almost all the top produce and nut items uh, consumers eat. So we're a very, very important part of America's food security and America's food choices when it comes to having a diverse and healthy diet that looks anything like the prescribed USDA pyramid, much of that food is coming out of California. And the bad news is um, the whole country and much of the world is relying on California's political system to continue to support this food system we have here in California and, and provide abundance and choices and, and diet diversity to America and the rest of the world. And I'm sorry, but it isn't looking good. There's a lot of bureaucratic um, enforcement coming down on California farmers that's threatening America's food food producers in a big way. Let's um, whether t- it comes to land, go ahead. I'm, no, no, go ahead. I, I just I want to I want to get into some of the specifics of your your case because um, you know you have had a, a years long battle in federal court. Um, and and it stemmed yeah. from something so innocuous. I, I think people's jaws are going to drop when they hear what brought the government into your life and and where it became such a fixture and demanding you know payments and fines and mitigation yeah. costs. We planted wheat in a wheat field during a global food crisis. In 2012, my family bought a property up in Tehama County. This is land that we owned. This is not government land. It's not Bureau of Land Management or anything else. This is deeded acres of them that we owned that had been farmed to wheat from the probably the 40s and 50s through the 70s, 80s, um, when wheat became very cheap. So in the early to mid 80s, wheat went down to $3 a bushel in current value. And it simply wasn't economic to grow wheat on this property. So it was used for cattle grazing over the last two decades, maybe plus a little bit. In 2012, if you recall back, there were reports going on in the uh, in the popular press about food inflation when there was no wage growth. Americans were stuck in the Great Recession. Food prices were going up. Grain prices were going up, mm. and there was a lot, there was a shortage. Uh, at that time, we put this property back into wheat production. We hired a, we hired a local operator up in the area who had the right equipment, and he tilled the ground and we planted a wheat crop. Now in the same area. There are many vineyards and orchards being planted, mainly orchards, walnuts, pistachios, and almonds. And if you if you go in there to plant an almond or walnut orchard, and you do in preparation what you do would be deep rip it. You'd want to rip it four to seven feet deep to make sure that the tree roots of the big orchard 
um, get down in the soil deep and, and the trees well anchored and able to get lots of water and nutrition down deep. Well, our tillage was five to seven inches deep, not five to seven feet deep. We had a Army Corps of Engineers, one guy, five counties, one field office up that way at the time with five counties to patrol, drive by and decided that we were deep ripping in preparation for an orchard planting. Well, they've got one guy in five counties in the Army Corps of Engineers d doing a drive by, decides he thinks he sees something that he thinks he understands, sends us a cease and desist notice, doesn't ask to meet us at the field, doesn't give us a hearing, doesn't call us into any kind of fact finding process, but concludes that we're deep ripping and sends us a cease and desist notice and tells us we can no longer farm our land because we're in violation of the Clean Water Act. Now the Clean Water Act has exemptions, very clear exemptions for normal agricultural activities. What we were doing was a normal agricultural activities. The Clean Water Act exemptions don't say anything about in the last two years or five years or 10 years or 20 years or what the history of the land was. They simply say normal farming activities are excluded from jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act was there to clean up factories mm -hmm. and point source polluters uh, that were polluting the navigable waters of the United States. Now, the wetlands on this property that the gentleman bureaucrat was concerned about us farming through were little dark spots in the grass and what's called vernal pools. If you live in the Midwest or prairie potholes, every farm in America that gets rained on has a low spot. It has a spot where the water collects or drains from or pools when it rains heavily. Um, this, this property is no different. It has low spots and, and areas where the water collects and pools. And we farm through those as every wheat farmer in this area does. They, I don't think the Army Corps of Engineers to date could show you an ongoing wheat operation that's farming around the vernal pools. Um, they, we farm through them. If you do an orchard system, if you're going to go in there and deep rip and just really tear up the soil and get it ready for, for tree plantings, <clears throat> then farmers will, will map these vernal pools and go around them because they're, they can be critical habitat for certain endangered and threatened species. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, by, by deep ripping them, you'd permanently eliminate them. There'd be no habitat value left in many of them. We didn't do that. We didn't plant an orchard, so we didn't go through the Army Corps delineation, verification, blah, blah, blah process. Um, they were confused. We asked them for a hearing. They wouldn't give us a hearing. They then sent us a second letter, kicked us up to the enforcement branch, and said, talk to them, not us. We then went to the Pacific Legal Foundation, Sacramento, California, now, anyone who's not familiar with the Pacific Legal Foundation, they're a law firm who does pro bono work on constitutional rights cases. I'm sure you guys have spoken to them many times. Great organization. Times on your show. Yeah, I call them the American Civil Liberties Union for Productive People. <laughs> they, they, um, and they, that, that's me, not them. But, uh, and, and that's what I see them as. These are the guys who do the same thing the American Civil Liberties Union used to do or says they do. Um, but they do it for property owners and business owners and, and families around America, take on some real important cases. They took the and filed a due process case against the United States Army Corps of Engineers saying you can't tell this farmer not to farm his land simply because of what you drive by and thought. You owe him a hearing from with an impartial judge who can look at the facts objectively and decide whether or not there's a bureaucratic action to be taken here or not. Um, enforcement action. Well, they couldn't get it kicked out of court. They tried twice with their first judge. They filed a retaliatory destruction of, law, of wetlands lawsuit against me in 2014. Now, they accused me of destroying these wetlands that had been farmed many times before in the exact or even more invasive way than I farmed them in an unprecedented set of charges based on, based on what they knew the facts to be at the time. They, um, at the end of the day, they claimed I owed the government over $45 million in fines and restoration costs wow. and mitigation costs for farming vernal pools to wheat that had been farmed to wheat many times before. Out of the 450 acres, they were claiming there were about 20 some odd acres of wetlands. The wetlands today, there's been no restoration action other than grazing cows on the property, which is what happened between the wheat originally planted there and my wheat field. 
the wetlands are thriving. They're in perfect health. They're, um, they're as they were before I farmed them. Yet, I've, in settlement before trial, my family's paid over one, paid $1.1 million in fines to settle a lawsuit where the Army Corps of Engineers and Jeff Sessions Department of Justice was threatening to ruin my family and destroy our business over planting wheat in a wheat field. That's amazing. Uh, John, yeah. uh, now talk, talk to me briefly about um, your your sense of kind of the political process and, you know, was this an awakening for you seeing this unfold? Did you previously have a lot of, you know, suspicions and and I don't know how you would describe your current attitude, you know, disgust or resentment or being appalled that this stuff could happen. What, what was it like for you kind of politically? Was this an eye awakening process? I find here's the reason I ask. A lot of people um, are kind of closed minded or don't pay attention to things or kind of tune out uh, the political process or what have you until something hits them. Right. Like a, a big tax increase yeah. happens or child services makes an allegation against them or they face a lawsuit. What was this uh, process right. for you like? You know, sometimes we think about the gangs and the mafia and say, hey, they only do it to each other. They only <laughs> do it to themselves. Uh-huh. Well, it's really easy to look at the goings on back in Washington, D.C. And we might we might clearly see the injustice of this open ended investigation of Donald Trump, where it's the old, you know, Bolshevik. You find me the man, I'll find you the crime. Um, you, you see that and you think, well, that's just happening back there. Hillary gets away with blue murder. Donald Trump gets away with nothing. I mean, he, they're investigating him on based on what his campaign manager did while working with a Podesta firm <laughs> that ran Hillary's campaign um, before he ever before he ever worked for for Donald Trump. And we think that it's just back there. But I'll tell you, there's so many things interconnecting right now with due process problems across the country. You've got you've got the Mueller investigation, which is just its own set of set of jokes. Um, Yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article about the Title IX enforcement of, of campus sexual misconduct allegations happening and how these kids are being brought before kangaroo courts and on campus to, um, to have their names ruined, to be threatened with expulsion and sus- suspension um, with student judges. And now there's, their names are going to be made public based on a current court ruling that's going to be ruinous for them in terms of their reputations in the age of social media. Hey, if there's a campus rape, suspension is not the penalty. We have a court system and a judicial system to properly punish that. Mm-hmm. If there's an accusation that's unfounded, we all deserve due process through the courts, not some kangaroo court on campus to ruin our reputations without having a proper a proper venue for to assert our innocence. Um, and so, in so this case, with your fam- in, in this case with your family, then are you the, are you then drawing the connection that you know, you you came to the realization that they can come after you. This isn't just you know far away fights that other people are having. No, due, due process is our Fifth Amendment right, and we we hear a lot about the Second Amendment, our right to bear arms and possess guns. We hear a lot about our First Amendment rights, but what's really happening in America today is a dissolution of our Fifth Amendment rights. I didn't realize before my case how important the Fifth Amendment was to to our ability to go about our, our happiness in America, but it's being offended in many ways at many levels. And it's being right. It's going from, you know, presidential level politicians to farmers up in Tehama County and myself to college kids on campus where mm-hmm. it could be used as a persecution tool for people. They don't like, they don't like Trump's so they're going to prosecute him until they can figure out how to impeach him for something. No. They don't like orchards up in this part of the state. So they're going to use the regulatory bureaucracy to to punish people who plant orchards where they'd rather have habitat preserves that they don't want to pay for. They don't like conservative outspoken kids on campus. Well, they now have a tool that could easily be be thrown at persecuting certain voices on campus. Now, John, my que- my next question pertains exactly to what you're kind of setting up here, and that is, uh, you said at the outset that this your case stemmed from kind of you know bureaucratic confusion about what you were doing. Uh, But it seems to me the root of the cause is basically what you were just describing, and that is broad laws that give a lot of discretion to uh, potentially nefarious uh, uh, bureaucrats 
and uh, individuals who can wield that th- that power with enough wiggle room, whereas you say, find me the person, you know, I'll find you the crime. Is it your sense that, that, that the real issue here is that there's this just broad discretion being given, loosely defined terms, you know, broad laws and powers that are being conferred rather than having things that are narrowly tailored to specific crimes and specific, you know, fact patterns? Is, is the issue here that we have, you know, breadth, too much breadth and discretion in the law that we're empowering these government actors with? You know, Connor, if, if you throw that at the Endangered Species Act, you're exactly right. The Endangered Species Act is a mess. And, and the agencies have been driving a bus through it for many, many decades. If you look at the Clean Water Act and you look at the very explicit, clear exemptions and exclusions under the Clean Water Act for agricultural activities, for plowing, and the limitation of the Clean Water Act's jurisdiction to navigable waters of the United States, you couldn't really go back to the senators and the congressmen that passed the Clean Water Act back in 1972 and beat them over the head with vague or imprecise language. Mm. It's a good act. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had court rulings. We've got Chevron deference, which is a, a court ruling that, that forces federal courts now to accept scientific conclusions from agencies rather than equally weighting the evidence between agencies and the regulated parties they're enforcing against. Uh, You've got bureaucracies. Um, you know, the big, the big thing I think that we're screwing up now, and it goes back to food security and, and, and just living costs here in many, many states in California, I mean, many states in the U.S., mainly California, is the sanctification of the environmental movement. These environmentalists are activists, and they're religious zealots, and they're willing to sacrifice many aspects of our quality of life for very, very marginal or false um, falsely perceived environmental benefits. John, one of the things that those activists have been very successful at doing is capturing the power of various government bureaucracies, particularly some of the alphabet agencies. Now, you mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers was where your trouble began. Tell us about some of the other agencies, though, that became involved in your case. Well, the Army Corps of Engineers got sued by us, so they went to the EPA and asked them if they wanted to sue us under Clean Water Act violation. The EPA had been assuring farmers, this was back in Obama's time when Gina McCarthy was the EPA director before Scott Pruitt, they'd been promising farmers that the new WOTUS rule would not affect them. But if you define 95% of America as WOTUS, farmers need not worry because farmers are exempt. Well, this case absolutely throws that away. That absolutely destroyed that. So the EPA wouldn't sign on with the Army Corps of Engineers. They then went to the Department of Justice, Water and Natural Resources Division, and got them to prosecute us for their resources from back in Washington, D.C. That was under Eric Holder, Loretta Lanchova, the, the, the finishing Department of Justice Attorney General was under Obama. Um, they then came onto the suit. When Jeff Sessions took over the Department of Justice, we thought we were going to be able to really use this lawsuit to... Um, clarify some important things for landowners. We thought that under Jeff Sessions' Department of Justice, we'd be able to settle the suit, quit having it threaten our company, but keep it alive to where we could take the highest courts possible with the Pacific Legal Foundation leading the charge. Are these waters even jurisdictional? Does the agricultural exemption in the Clean Water Act require that you have a continuous ongoing farming operation, growing wheat or other field crops when they're entirely unprofitable so as to maintain the right to farm them when they are profitable, hmm. even though you won't own your business because you'll have been losing money for 20 years. Um, you know, d- do farmers and property owners have a right of due process under these agencies? And what exactly does that due process right look like? I'm sure the founding fathers didn't picture a guy riding by a property and deciding he, he knew, about, knew more about what he saw than he did. Took it out. Then there were all kinds of discoveries during our case, the Army Corps of Engineers field agent literally told us that he sanitized the file and organized it before he forwarded it on to the, to the Department of Justice. Huh. We, we clarified that with him. He took out important and unimportant documents from the file before forwarding it where we could actually, um, actually review what was in their file to begin with. John, it seems to me that, you know, here's a, a, a classic case of as it were, you know, David versus Goliath, you're, you're being required through your own taxes to subsidize your opposition 
coming after you that is harming your way of life and through you, all the people that your company and your business serves. I can imagine our listeners right now have a key question in mind, and that is, as you said, you know, the definitions in the Clean Water Act are fairly airtight and, and well-defined. You think that, it, you know, what you were doing comports exactly with the exemption uh, that the, you know, typical farming activity had. How in the world in America is it just, and can this be, the question uh, would go, that an individual who is compliant with the law can nevertheless be required to pay over a million dollars in fines to the government? How do you square the outcome of your case with the whole, you know, at least general concept that many people have about our government and the society that we live in? Help our viewers, or excuse me, our listeners understand um, your thoughts and feelings on the outcome of this case. I mean, are you relieved that you just didn't have to pay more? How do you square the outcome of your case with the firm position you have, that you were compliant with the law? How do you, how do you jive that? Well, it, it's incredibly frustrating and disappointing, especially under this current administration. I mean, Donald Trump was never vague on his campaign trail as to what his support were farmers for farmers were and what his suspicions of the new WOTUS rule and kind of the hyper-enforcement of environmental policy was. And, and this administration has been terrific in alleviating a lot of regulatory injustices and regulatory um, overload. The, the Department of Justice under Sessions has, has failed in so many ways. They, um, they could have set this case up to be, um, to be a platform for, for review of, of many different important property rights features for farmers and property owners across the country. Um, we know when we head into court, you know, my family knew when we had into, headed into court on this, that there was uncertainty and there'd be potentially many different outcomes. We never imagined that it would cost us $3 million to refute in legal costs and, and expert costs to refute a government that went out to our fields, took two weeks to find out the tillage was in fact five to seven inches tall, deep, and then went ahead and purported that we damaged the environment regardless of the fact that the tillage was a fraction of the depth they thought it was. Hmm. They, um, they literally made up, made up language. Um, I read some of it at the Range Rights Symposium. They called the little ripples, the little ruffle potato chips from our plow tracks, mini mountain ranges. <laughs> and actually had a, a photograph in their expert report with a tape measure going across the ridges and down again, uh, a second tape measure going down to show that they were five inches tall. I mean, a farmer leaving five inch tall furrows across ground that's been farmed many times before is now subject to $45 million in damages and mitigation fees. That's amazing. Kind of gives a whole new meaning to making mountains out of molehills, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. We call them Sierra de Minimis. The big mountain range here in California is the Sierra Nevada. We call them Sierra de Minimis. We, we joked about that quite a lot. They, um, they came up with things, microtopographic high spots. Wow. They, they, wrote, they wrote crap in their expert report about, it's like you're reading Horton Here's a Who from Dr. Seuss about this plowing being equivalent to a storm that goes into a small community and completely tears it apart and mixes it. Well, you know what? That's what plows do, and that's how we eat. I mean, human society is built upon tilling soil somewhere, John, it's, and it everywhere gets rained on. It, it, it seems like uh, I, I can imagine our listeners thinking, like, you, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Here you are, you know, applying productive use to the land and and benefiting many people through your activities, and you're you're punished for doing so. And even as you, you know, win your case or settle your case. You're still on the losing end of things. It does not inspire a lot of confidence in the justice system, regardless of, uh, you know, which party is in control and, you know, beyond the justice system, the bureaucratic agencies uh, more broadly. As you look forward, as we wrap up this episode here, I mean, we'll, we'll link on the show notes page, uh, societyinthestate.com slash 78, more information about your story and this issue more broadly. As you look towards the future... You know, do you have hope and confidence? Are you more resigned to the problems that are out there? What is your attitude? You're in the thick of things. You've at great sacrifice had to navigate these systems and, and bear a great cost for trying to farm land that you own, which is rather ridiculous when you say it that way. What, what are your thoughts looking forward, you know, positive, negative? What, what's your attitude having gone through everything that you have now? Well, the one thing all, all listeners should ask their congressman for are we want Congressional Review Act hearings on this case and others much like it this summer before the elections 
we want Congressional Review Act hearings on these enforcement practices. That's the tool Congress has to protect the clear language in the Clean Water Act. Me, I'm going to dust myself off. I'm going to get back to working at my family company, which is Doherty Nursery. We sell trees and vines to thousands of farmers up and down California throughout the western states. <clears throat> and I'm, I still think there's a bright future. Um, there's, you know, read Progressive Fascism by or um, Liberal Fascism um, as a book. But what is his name? Jonah Saul. Jonah, is um, it Jonah Goldberg? Yeah, Jonah Goldberg. Read, read Liberal Fascism by Jonah Goldberg. Get it on tape. You'll find out that our challenges today aren't that different than challenges that have been faced within Western civilization for over a century now. It, um, we can fight this back, but the one, the one principle I go to is we live in an unnatural state of freedom here in America. Our expectations are based on an exceptional state of freedoms that we expect. This isn't reversion to some silly future. This is a reversion to the past, it, the way peop the people lived for centuries and millennia before us in America, and the way people around most of the world live today. Mm -hmm. What is happening through our bureaucrat bureaucracies is completely normal through most of history and through most places on earth today. Until we accept that what we've got is exceptional and continue to fight for it to stay in an exceptional place, we're gonna um, we're gonna slide back. Those are great concluding they're, they're thoughts, huge John. Forces. Great concluding thoughts. Uh, definitely motivation for uh, food for thought and, and motivation to get active. As you say, reach out to congressmen and try and actually make a difference to prevent this stuff from happening. As I said, we'll link to more information about this issue on the show notes page today, which is societyinthestate.com/78. Uh, John, thank you very much for for being in the fight and for sharing your story with our listeners today. Connor, Brian, Brian, thank you guys for what you do every day. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 